Good morning. It's good to see you all here this morning for our normal Bible class hour. But our brother J.P. Croflin, who's a member and a deacon here at the Valdosta Congregation, he's going to be speaking to us this morning. And brother J.P. is going to be talking with us about the need for moral courage to conquer our fears. And I I thought I gave him an easy topic, and then after I got to looking at it, I thought, well, that's not that easy, I don't think. I don't know how I would have even approached that. But Brother J.P. did an outstanding job um, in his manuscript, and I thought he had a very unique way of, an appro of approaching it. So Brother J.P. is married to Sister Amber Croplin. They were married in 2009. They have three children, and... Um, he graduated in 06 with a BS in electronic engineering, and he's currently working for RL Consulting as the senior controls engineer. And uh, he's also been working here at Valdosta as a, a part-time youth minister and uh, an associate minister. And uh, that's taken place since 2011. And we're certainly glad to have Brother JP here, and he's a... Uh, not only a brother in Christ, but a very good friend, and I appreciate him, and uh, he's worked very hard here in our effort, and I'm going to turn the floor over to you, brother. Let me just start out and say the clock's not running, so I got as long as I need this morning. I appreciate all of you being here this morning. Our regular members, thank you for being here this morning. Our visiting folks that are with us, thank you for being here for sticking around, um, supporting our lectureship. We really appreciate the lessons that we've had over the last two days. Guys, it's been amazing. Um, I'm tired, and uh, I know you speakers are tired. You put a lot of effort into it, but we're here. It's the Lord's Day. We're going to worship Him, and so for this Bible class hour, um, I get to take the podium. Our elders let me once again get up here, so uh, I'm thankful for it, and y'all are... are uh, well, I guess you're the victims this morning. Well, we deeply appreciate you. And I want to mention Brother Matthew. You know, uh, he's been a good support, a good friend. You know, you, you get to know somebody when you go out on a fishing boat with them. You spend all afternoon with a bow in your hand, and he watches you miss and miss and miss and miss and miss and miss and miss. Yet he's still supportive, and we went out together. We, we fished. That was really our first time 
hanging out, man, and I tell you what, he shot the biggest catfish I've ever seen. So proud, he held it up here, and I got pictures on my phone, it's great. But uh, it really, it, it was good. We were able to visit the whole time, and he never made fun of me for missing every single fish. I shot one, we, we fried it and ate it, and uh, then everybody told me, you're not supposed to eat that fish. I said, oh, <laughs> well, we did, and I'm still alive, so that's good. So uh, Matthew was not joking when he said that uh, he gave me a difficult topic. Of course, I think if I would have just been given the task of introducing our speakers, that would have been difficult for me, but um, I liked this topic. I was very excited when he told me. I was honored that he wanted me to speak at this lectureship. Um, it has always been kind of a, a dream of mine to be able to present lessons at a lectureship or at a gospel meeting, uh, you know, and so this is my opportunity, and I I'm deeply grateful for him. I also wanted to mention quickly um, those that helped me, you know, being as this is it's my first go around, I've never written a manuscript. I was grossly underestimated the uh, volume of time it would take, the amount of effort it takes. And so I guess you'd say like every other preacher, I uh, used my time wisely and waited till the last minute. But I want to thank my wife, Amber. She helped me with this. I want to thank my sister, Carrie. Uh, Farrell for her assistance with this as well, and I want to thank my brother Peyton Jenkins for his assistance in helping me get through this. All right, let's get into our lesson this morning because it's important and I got a lot of paper to cover, so um, I do encourage you to get the book. Please read the manuscripts. I'm, I'm a terrible reader, but I can't wait to get in and read what I've already heard the last two days, and so we look forward to um, how this is going to go for the rest of today. I want to ask you, what are you afraid of? I started out when I tried to compile uh, my lesson, and I, and I thought, well, I'm going to start right with courage, and we're going to go straight into courage. And I quickly realized that I, I, I went the wrong direction, and so I swapped it. I wanted to focus on fears. And I said, okay, I need moral courage to conquer my fears, and so I wanted to define what are fears. And so I asked myself, what are fears? What am I afraid of? Now, you're welcome to read an embarrassing story in the book, and I appreciate if you wouldn't make fun of me for it, but read the book, um, and there's a, a little account in the book of me. I'm not going to talk about that right now. So I went to 2001 Gallup poll, and I wanted to know, what are people afraid of? What are the top things they're afraid of? And let me tell you, I, I catch every single one of them. Snakes, public speaking, heights, uh, being closed in a small space, spiders and insects, needles and shots, mice flying on an airplane, dogs, thunder, lightning, Crowds going to the doctor and the dark. <laughs> I should have stayed home, right? <laughs> but that was what the top polls were. The Gallup poll in 2001, the, the thing that people are most afraid of, that was, and it's by percentage, it's crazy. So we all understand that we're, we're crippled by fear sometimes, right? We're, we, we all have to acknowledge that we have fears. There's no getting around it or doing without it. Um, it's something that we're all going to face. You know, Mark Twain wrote, he said, courage is the resistance to fear, uh, the master of fear and not the absence of it. And so knowing these things, it's, the ab it's not the absence of fear. I cannot say that I'm 100% fearless. No, there's, there's fear there. I have to acknowledge and overcome my fears, and they can't be crippling fears. I can't be stuck, uh, idle, and do nothing. We have challenges that we must rise up and conquer constantly. Um, we're, are we courageous enough to place self last and give all for the greater good. You know, that would be us conquering our fears, would be putting self last or, or doing what has to be done. I want to consider the words of Edward Kennedy in reference to uh, Robert Kennedy. It says, few are willing to brave the disapproval of their fellows, to censor their, the censor of their colleagues, the wrath of their society. Moral courage is a rarer commodity than the bravery in battle or great intelligence. Yet it is the one essential vital quality for those who seek to change the world that yields most painfully to change. It takes a lot to be morally courageous. I understand that there is courage and we can think of battlefield examples where, where somebody is pinned down and everybody's petrified with fear and you hear stories of that one person that, that mounts up in courage and they dive over the top of the hill and they assault this group. And that by all means is courage and, 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 and I applaud people that are courageous in times like that. There are people sometimes that they say, you know, when I'm courageous I, I act without thinking. I don't even know what came over me. Folks, that's different than moral courage. 
when you act without thinking, that is, an, that is an impulse thing, and it's bravery. It's very courageous, and we applaud that. What we're talking about today is, is moral courage. It's a planned and purposeful amount of courage. The three points that we're going to cover today, what is moral courage? The fears that will prevent us and employing moral courage to conquer those fears. So we need to define what is moral courage. My typical technique is to go to dictionary.com. I look up definitions, and I try and share them with you. What is Courage, according to dictionary.com, it says the quality of mind or spirit that enables a person to face difficulty, danger, or pain without fear. Properly put, or as I would define it, is courage is that determination that allows us to muster the resolve to face the challenge that has presented itself to us. The courage to and determination to muster the resolve to face the challenge before us. What are morals? Morals, as defined by dictionary.com, is relating to or concerning with the principles or rules of right of conduct or the distinction between right and wrong. Moral courage is maintaining righteousness when all things are difficult, scary, or even deadly. Maintaining a state of rightness through trials or selfless. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote, Cowardice asked the question, is it safe? Expediency asked the question, is it politic? Vanity asks the question, is it popular? But conscience asks the question, is it right? And there comes a time when one must take that position that is neither safe, nor politic, nor popular, but one must be taken because simply it is right. Moral courage <clears throat> then would be uh, a combining of these things. That would be, I'm courageous enough to act even when it puts myself out and it's all founded and based on the morals that I have, that I have established. Rushworth Kidder wrote in his book, it says, principles that distinguish moral courage from ordinary courage. Uh, principles are what distinguish moral courage from ordinary courage. The, the presence of danger is the only way to know that real cur courageousness is uh, at issue. The endurance and endurance is a combination of character and attitudes of confidence and trust that enables people to risk dangers to defend principle. All of that pieced together, guys, there's dangers that we're going to have to face. Those are going to be the temptations that come towards us, those opportunities for us to hide. Your principle would be the moral foundation, the structure that you have, and then these times that we come, the, these times that come towards us, our endurance is how many times are you going to do this? Can you do this over and over again? Are your moral codes, your moral standards strong enough that when in the face of danger, opportunity to fail, are you going to have the endurance to hold true to those values? Moral courage, it's so much based in values. So much is based in, in values. We have principles that were founded upon our morals to have moral courage. I want to bring up a few points with regard to the fears that would prevent us. Our, our, our title, again, is the need for moral courage to conquer our fears. Folks, if we fail to conquer our feels, fears, we will be hindered in some way. You will be held back or restricted in some way. And I want you to understand very vividly the consequences of events. I want you to look with me, if you would, turn to Judges chapter 6. In the book of Judges, we read about um, a young man named Gideon. Now Gideon, self-proclaimed, he said, uh, God comes to him and says, Gideon, I'm going to use you to rise up and lead an army against uh, the, the uh, Midianites. And Gideon's response to God I thought was interesting. If you look in chapter 6 and verse number 15, he says to him, or the angel of the Lord, I'm sorry. It sa he says unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my father's house. You talk about somebody that wasn't sure of himself. He looks to the angel of the Lord that came to him and said, God's going to use you to save the children of Israel from this present distress. And Gideon goes, Me? I'm the low man on the totem pole. I, I'm nobody. God said, no, you're the right one. 
And so as we continue on through this, God shows Gideon through, through these different examples that he's going to use Gideon to lead this army to a great and powerful victory, lead these people out of captivity, fight back this, this foreign nation. So Gideon assembles this army, and if I can count properly, he's got about 32,000 soldiers. 32,000 soldiers assembled. Folks, if I was going to raise an army against another army, Jesus says to us in, in Luke chapter 14, verse 31, what king wages war with another nation without making sure he's got sufficient people? Gideon gathers up this group, oh, 32,000. I don't know how many he's going up against, but folks, perhaps 31,999 wasn't enough. 32,000, Gideon said, this is good I'm, I'm feeling good. God said, I'm with you. I'm going to lead these people. We are fantastic. Let's do this. And what does God say to him? Look at in chapter 7 and verse number 1, starting in verse number 1. And Jeroboam, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod, so that the hosts of the Midianites were uh, on the north side of them by the hill of Moreh in the valley. And the Lord said to Gideon that the people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. Excuse me, what? <laughs> uh, okay. Verse number two. Or verse number three, it says, Now therefore go, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early, from the Mount of Gilead. Uh, what? <laughs> and there returned of the people 22,000, and there remained 10,000. Folks, two thirds of his army packed up and went home because they were afraid. Gideon said, I'm the least in my family. I don't want to do this, I'm nobody. And God reassures him and says, no, I'm going, to I'm going to use a great victory through your hand. You are going to lead my people, and so go. And he says, absolutely, you gathered the people, you showed me the signs, I'm ready to go, let's conquer these people. And God says, oh, by the way, I'm going to take two-thirds of your group and send them home. That in and of itself would be enough to cause anybody to fully have, have a, a panic attack. Folks, these people that left, it says specifically they left because they were fearful and afraid. When we don't have the moral courage that we need, we are afraid. And think about the great victory that these brethren, these, these members of God's chosen people missed out on because of fear. Fear held them back from, from being part of God's glorious victory in which he continues then to reduce the army down and then win this victory with such a small amount of people that truly you can say this is God's hand that saved these people. As a, as a man, fear cripples us. And we say, are you serious right now? Two-thirds of my group have to leave for fear they left. Fears of doubt and uncertainty will lead us and prevent us and hold us back. I want to consider, if you would, Thomas. If I say the name Thomas and I ask you what is the most notable uh, feature of Thomas, every one of you would respond with his doubt. Thomas was there. Thomas was the one that, that saw the miracles that Jesus did. Thomas walked with the Lord. He was one of the twelve. He was very involved. He was very active. He watched day after day, walked with the Lord, had faith with the Lord, and... and saw him taken, he saw him beaten, saw him strung up on a tree, he saw the thorns go on his head, he saw them take the lifeless body of Jesus down and throw him into a tomb, he saw the giant rock roll in front of the tomb. Folks, if your greatest hero went through all of that, how would you respond as well? How would you respond as well? And what does Jesus call Thomas? When Thomas says, guys, he, I saw it. I was there. I saw. I, I cannot believe that Jesus returned from the dead. I saw all of it. Thomas lacked moral courage to stand up and say, he will rise because he told us that. And Jesus comes to him and he says, 
Don't be faithless anymore. Reach your hand, reach your fingers through the hands. Reach your hand into the side and, and be not faithless. Thomas goes down in infamy for his doubt. Lack of faith. Fears from lack of faith. I want you to consider the account in Matthew chapter 14. You're welcome to turn over there. Matthew chapter 14. I want to consider this account where the apostles have been with Jesus. They've just been working in the area. And Jesus says, go ahead and get into the boat and cross the sea and I'll come join you. And so the apostles are in the midst of the sea. They're struggling and they're fighting. The wind is contrary to them. It's boisterous. Things are not going well. And they're struggling. And they look out and they see a figure standing out on the water. The Bible reveals to us they thought it was a ghost. Matthew 14. And Jesus says in verse number 27, Be of good cheer. It is I. Don't be afraid. When the Savior of the world tells you don't be afraid, that should be something that wipes all of our fear away. And it did. If you look at the Apostle Peter, he says in verse number 28, he answered and said unto him, Lord, if it be you, bid me to come out on the water. The Lord says, come. And Peter becomes the second person in the history of the world to walk on water. Written down for us to see this great and wonderful miracle. Fears of lack of faith. What does Peter do shortly after? He takes his eyes off the prize, takes his eyes off the Lord. He looks around and he becomes afraid. And he starts to sink and he cries out, Lord, save me! The Lord reaches out his hand and takes him back up. And he says in verse number 31, O thou of little faith, why did you doubt? Fears of doubt will prevent us from fulfilling. We, we read about this. Peter walked on water. He was the only one that was confident enough in the Lord to say, Lord, let me come and be with you. Yet when he took his eyes off the prize, he took his eyes off the Lord, he begins to sink and he was afraid, instantly afraid. This world had swallowed him up. And Jesus says, oh, you of little faith. He reaches out and saves him. A lack of faith will prevent us, will keep us from being what we ought to be. I want you to consider Lot's wife. In Genesis chapter 19, we read about Lot. We read about the events of Sodom and Gomorrah. We read about the angels coming to Lot and saying, get you and all of your family up and out. Get out. We, the Lord is going to destroy this city. Specific instructions are given to them. Don't even look back. Don't even look back. Of course, you and I know from our reading one did look back. And she was turned to a pillar of salt. And that was it for her. Her story ends. Do you realize? Jesus says in Luke chapter 17, he starts talking about preparing for the second coming, making sure that all of your affairs are in order. And he gives them the admonition in verse number 32 of Luke 17. Remember Lot's wife. Why, why did Jesus say in the midst of preparing for the second coming, if you're up on the rooftop, come straight down. Don't go back down and get your things. You are going to go to the Lord. Don't waste time with worldly possessions. Go straight to the Lord. When the Lord comes again, remember Lot's wife. She looked back. Where were her cares and her concerns? Where were her priorities that she was focused on at that moment? The Lord is, is destroying sin in that city. He destroyed the city because of the sins and the things that they were participating in. He's bombarding it. He's burning it. There are, it is destruction wiped from the face of the earth. And for whatever reason, curiosity, her own lack of faith, her, her, cure, her, her whatever it is, her priorities, having a care of something of that place, she was turned to a pillar of salt. And Jesus says, when the second coming happens, be prepared. Remember Lot's wife. Leave it all behind. Lack of faith. Lack of faith, eye on the prize, will prevent us. I, I introduced a term that I was unfamiliar with. It's called trepidation. Now, what I understand of trepidation, it's a fear of something that may happen. You know, as a parent, I think we're pretty, pretty skilled at trepidation. Oh, don't touch that. Oh, don't go up there. Don't climb on that. You know, we're, we're pretty good. Oh, I know what's going to happen. I'm afraid of what's going to happen. We're, it's not necessarily a bad thing. 
to be cautious and aware. I remember a specific event where I was at a, I was at a, a bicycle uh, fundraiser for a, a Bible camp I was at. And this little girl at the end of the day stood up on her little plastic bicycle and she was trying to get a drink out of the water fountain. And I said, I will help you. You know, let me come lift you up because, you know, it's one of them rickety little bicycles. So she's standing up on it and I said, look, let me help you. You're going to fall. Well, not that I'm a prophet or anything, but she totally fell, busted her chin right on the edge of it. And I'm like, I don't know why you're crying now. I told you, don't climb up there. I knew what was going to happen. I was concerned for her but it didn't freeze me from doing anything. I offered assistance. Well, we need to understand examples like the one talent man. You know the account where Jesus is telling them that a man is leaving to a foreign country and so he takes talents and he gives to one man five, to one man two, and to one man one talent. The five talent man takes then his talents. He goes and uh, turns it to the changers, to the money changers, and it gives back to his master when he returns home five more. Ten talents from this man. Good job. Thou good and faithful servant. He takes the two-talent man. His money goes to the exchangers. He brings it back, returns to his master. Four talents. Good job. Good and faithful servant. The one-talent man, what does he do? In Matthew 25, he says he takes his talent. I digged in the earth. Because I was afraid. Because I was afraid. I was afraid of what might happen. I could lose it. I was afraid of what might happen. I knew that you were a man that wanted returns, and so <laughs> what's yours is yours again. How did that master respond to him for being too afraid of what might happen? It says to him in verse number 26, Thou wicked and slothful servant, you were petrified by fear that you couldn't even do a simplest task. And use this talent like I gave it to you. Now, Adam went through a great job a few weeks ago to tell us that a talent is not this small, you know, meaningless coin. It could be a large volume of value, whatever it is. And the expectation of the master was to do something with that. Bring that back. No. This one talent man was too afraid, and so it prevented him from receiving that well done, that good and faithful servant. Well done. And he buried it, stuck it in the backyard. You guys are familiar with the man named Nicodemus. John chapter 3, we're introduced to Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a leader. Uh, he was, he was uh, someone in high regard. In verse, number two, or verse number 1 of chapter 3 of John, it says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles which thou do except God be with him. Nicodemus comes and he offers these words. Now, I know that there's some interpretation. It could be a trap. It could be... No, I don't think this is a trap. I think this really is earnest. I know that you're from God. I can see the things that you do. There's no way you are not from God. And Jesus replies to him, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus says to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb? What a great question. He is engaging the Savior of the world, the keeper of the, the, the rules and laws. He's the one that knows. He fulfills the old law. And Nicodemus is a master of the old law. And he goes to Jesus and he says, Who are you? Tell me. You are somebody important. And Jesus tells him and engages with him. And they have this discussion. And you're like, Oh, he's so close. Nicodemus, commit. Go with the Lord. We really don't see that. In verse number 9, the, after Jesus exchanges with him, it says Nicodemus answers and said, how can these things be? And then we don't hear any more about Nicodemus. How can these things be? A, 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 a bewilderment. How can these things be? Nicodemus, he was clearly had a curiosity and an interest in the teaching of Jesus. He, he snuck to Jesus through cover of night. Um, he asks him great questions, meaningful questions. Curiosity is piqued. Nicodemus doesn't commit, though. Is it for fear of his reputation? Is it for fear of his status? Is it just fear in and of itself? I don't know. I can't answer this. However, I will say, John chapter 19, Nicodemus is one that comes to Jesus after he was killed, after he's hung on the cross. 
He brings spices to help with the burial process of Jesus. This could be a sign. It could be an indication that Nicodemus had a change of heart. The scriptures don't tell us. I don't think so. I think Nicodemus still was afraid. He was crippled by his fear. Trepidation or fear of what might happen, loss of status, loss of respect of your peers, can be something that will prevent us. And we need moral courage to overcome these fears. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 says that God has given us a spirit, has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Deuteronomy 3 and verse 16 says, Be strong and courageous. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. We have to conquer these fears. We cannot be crippled by them. It takes moral courage to overcome some of our fears. I want to bring you a few examples of moral courage. I would also venture to tell you that my list is not full. If you go and you look and you read through your Bibles, you'll see examples of moral courage throughout everything. When you see heroes stand up, when they are the only ones, we've been reading Jeremiah on Sunday mornings and I have really enjoyed it. Brother Matthew told us that that Jeremiah was going to be a great book and I was like, this sounds old. Folks, it's a great book. A lot of good stuff in it. Jeremiah is the only one in that area standing up and telling a king and all against all of the king's prophets. He's the only one rising up and saying, no, this is the God of heaven and this is what he expects. You will be cast down from your throne. Your people will be enslaved. There's only one way to come out of this alive. Moral courage to the core. God speaking to him saying, Jeremiah, you take my word and you go tell these people. That's not even a point on my outline, but that's a freebie. Moral courage to cast away doubts. I want to consider Elijah, the prophet. In 1 Kings 18, we read of his, of his uh, competition, if you will, that God helps him through to set up an altar or challenge the prophets of Baal to build an altar and offer sacrifices. And the account that we're familiar with where the prophets of Baal spend the entire day cutting themselves, yelling and screaming, asking for their God, Baal, to do something. Do something! And all day long, and I, you know, you guys know me, I got a lot of sarcasm in me, and I love, perhaps he's asleep. <laughs> Maybe he's gone away. Just yell a little louder, you'll get him. I love it. Love it. 450 Prophets, 450 against one. When you carry a big stick, a big stick called God the Father, folks, you can have that moral courage to stand up knowing God is on my side, He is with me, and Elijah watches this, these theatrics all day, mocks them in the process, and offers one prayer to God when it's His turn and it is consumed. The God of heaven responds, and this great victory is won. Verses 36 and 37 read for us, The Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that Thou art the God in Israel, and I am Thy servant, and that I have done all the things at, that, at Thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that Thou art the Lord God, and that Thou hast turned their heart back again. Folks, confidence, moral courage to stand up and do what you're called to do. When we have moral courage, biblically based, grounded faith, moral courage, it will dispel doubts. I want you to also know that in the next chapter, Elijah falls hard. Falls hard and he says, I alone am here. I'm afraid they're going to kill me. I am afraid. And God has to remind him and pick him back up. We see him at his peak in chapter 18. We see him at his low in chapter 19. Moral courage is a constant thing that we have to work on constantly. How do we keep ourselves refreshed? How do we keep ourselves? It's by doing things like this, like coming together on Sunday morning, by study of God's word, constant prayer, 
all of these techniques that we've been talking about all week, keep yourself grounded in the faith. You're going to fall and you're going to struggle, but guys, when there's a victory to be wrought, 450 prophets of Baal were executed that day. The nation was revived. Great victories when we stand up with moral courage. It strengthens our faith. I want to bring your attention to Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13, I think you're aware of where I'm going. The spies from the children of Israel are sent into the land of Canaan. They're sent to go and evaluate the land. Twelve spies. Twelve spies are sent. In verse number 17, it says of chapter 13, And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said unto them, Get you up this way southward and go into the mountain and see the land that what is. And the people that dwell therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many. And what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad. And what the cities and where they dwell in, whether tents or in strongholds. And what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether there be wood therein or not. And be ye of good courage and bring the fruit of the land. Now the times was the time of the first grapes. Moses gives them this instruction. I want you guys, you twelve, go and inspect this land that the Lord God has promised to us. And he says, this will be yours. I will deliver it into your hands. Go and search out the land. Come and report. Twelve men sent in. For 40 days, they search out this land. They go and they take account of what people are there. And as they come and they return, in verse number 25, it says they return from their search of the land after the 40 days. And verse number 26, And they went and came to Moses and Aaron, and they said to the congregation of the children of Israel, unto the wilderness of Paran and Kadesh, and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation, and showed them the fruit of the land. And they said to him, uh, and they told him and said, We came into land, whether thou sentest us, and surely it flows of milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Oh, sounds great. Good job. It truly is. This land that God said exactly this is what it is. Verse number 28, Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. And the Amorites dwell in the land in the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites, they dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and the coast of Jordan. People begin to, to complain. Oh, it's, it's too much. We can't make it. There's no way. It's great land. It's exactly what God said it would be. Even though God also told us he would give it to us, it's too, way too big. We can't handle it. These people are giants. We'll never take it. There's only 12. Caleb stands up. Caleb stills the people before Moses and says, let us go up at once. Let us go up at once and take it, possess it. We are able to overcome it. Twelve men. We can't do this. Eleven men. We can't do this. And one man go, no, you're wrong. Stand up and take it now. God gave it to us. You ever been the only one to try and speak reason to a group of upset people? Brother Chris yesterday talked to us about um, when there's a group of people doing something, it's so often that we want to, to start doing what the group is doing. Why did the woman stand up and down every time the bell went off? She had no idea. Sometimes, though, we're influenced by the group around us. Eleven people are standing up and whining and complaining to Moses. It's too big. We can't do it. God's not good enough. And Caleb says, no, we can do this. Of course, God punishes the children of, of Israel. But Caleb is recognized, Numbers chapter 14, and verse 24, for having a different spirit. Folks, I hope every single one of you has a different spirit. A morally based, courageous spirit. Be different. Cour moral courage sometimes requires us to be selfless and honest. I want to I want to talk very quickly about the account of David and Nathan. You understand the account of David with Bathsheba and how he sinned against himself, sinned against God. He uh, committed adultery or fornication with Bathsheba. He ended up murdering Uriah the Hittite. He takes this woman to be his wife under a huge lie. And Nathan the prophet, he's going to go before a very successful warrior king 
and you're going to look him in the face and you're going to tell him, you are wrong. A lot of us would love to be under the rug right there, crawling underneath the carpet. Uh, David, it's your fault. No, Nathan stands up, points to him and says, you are the man. And how does David respond to this? How does David respond? A king had the right to say, I want him dead right now. Nobody in this room heard anything. I want him dead. He's gone. Disappear him. David's broken. He's broken. And he, he says, I am so sorry. I have sinned against God that I have done this wrong. Moral courage for Nathan to stand up and look at a king and tell him, it is your fault. You are that man. And moral courage for David to be broken and humbled and say, I am wrong. I want to be right. Sometimes moral courage requires us to be selfless and honest. Moral courage dispels trepidation. I want to consider this as well. Again, using David as an example in 1 Samuel chapter 17. I want to turn over there. 1 Samuel chapter 17, we're going to read. Verses 3 through verse 7. And the Pharisees stood on the mount on the one side, and the Israelites stood on the mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion from the, from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in span. He had a helmet of brass upon his head. He was armed with a coat of mail. It weighed the, the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. He had greaves of brass upon his legs, a target of brass between his shoulders. The staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing his shield went before him. Whoa. I have a friend that drew an, uh, he drew a poster for their VBS of Goliath, and it's a monstrosity. I wish that I, I, I didn't, I'm sorry, I apologize, I didn't even take down inches and feet measurements for you. Man was a giant. He's huge. I have, tried, have you ever picked up a sack of, of coins? Have you ever picked up a sack of coins? So my, my stepfather and I, uh, we would go around sometimes. There was a man that owned pay phones. Do you remember pay phones? You could go and put the coins in there, ching, 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 right, and make a call. Not just a collect call, but... So uh, these pay phones, they'd have coins in them, and you have to collect those coins, empty the container, you know, and put the change back in so that way it can be uh, cycled through for the next time. And uh, I remember, as a young man, the coin bags get heavy. And I had a task in, in high school. I was supposed to use some abrasing... Uh, technique, and I was supposed to make this basket to put these bags of coins in so they wouldn't fall over in the car, you know, because they'll topple over and coins go everywhere. It's just a terrible mess. And uh, so I had to use these full bags of coins. They are heavy. I don't know how many coins was in there. But I do know when it says that his, the head of his spear was 600 shekels of iron. I don't know how much a shekel of iron is. Maybe it's the weight of a penny. Maybe it's the weight of a dime. I don't know how many coins is in a bag of coins, but I, for one, could not take that coin bag and lift it up over my head. Can you imagine if you're taking a sledgehammer, held onto the end of it, and tried to hold it straight out? This old boy is not strong enough to do that. I don't have wrist muscles to even hold that. The man's spear head, the head of his spear weighed as much as that whole bag of coins. The spear head. I'm not even talking about the pole it was attached to. Never the fact, nevertheless, the fulcrum in which his hand held that spear put all the weight of that thing on the end of it, and that man was holding that spear. That was his weapon of war. This man was a giant. He was huge. And he goes out and he stands in front of the, the armies of Israel and he, he mocks them. He shouts things to them. A challenge is offered. In verses 8 and 9, it says, If you kill me, we'll become your slaves. If I kill you, you become our slaves. Put your best champion up to it, and I'll face him. If it was like a continual thing, like if any one of you guys ever defeats me, then we'll be your slaves. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep killing your champion. You know, I could say, okay, you know, maybe that'd be reasonable. But no, when it's one guy, you only get one shot with Goliath. If you die, we own you. And if I die, you own us. The stakes are unbelievably high. And here comes this little shepherd boy. 
And he brings food to his brothers who are in the army. And he, he, what's going on? And he hears the shout of Goliath from, Hey, Israel! Where's your champion? The whole army's petrified. The army of the great God of heaven is petrified and will not stand up against them. And David goes, who is this uncircumcised Philistine shouting these things, these blasphemies against the Lord? And why has anybody shut him up? Oh, David, you don't understand. The stakes are way too high. I'll kill him. Oh, David. Oh, his brother comes up to him and says, who do you think you are? You come to see a show, did you? Why don't you run back home and take care of the sheep? David's like, no, I'm going to go take care of that man. They let David do that. They let David go and take care of Goliath, and he did. They put armor on him, and he's all he's like, I can't use this. He said, I never proved armor. I'm too small. So he takes it all off, and he goes out there, and he finds him three stones out of the creek, and he picks them up, puts them in his satchel. And Goliath stands up and walks out to the edge. Hey, Israel, where's your champion? Here comes David. Hey, here I come. I'm right here. And David kills that man with a slingshot. And he is dead. The whole army of Israel was too afraid to stand up. They were petrified of what might happen. Granted, the stakes are very, very high. And David walks out there and slays him and takes his own sword and cuts off Goliath's head. And the entire army of the Philistine goes, "Uh uh-oh, uh-oh. And they all turn and run. And the children of Israel chase after the Philistines. David had unwavering faith and he wasn't going to allow trepidation or fear of what might happen to keep him from accomplishing this great and miraculous thing. He slew Goliath the giant. That dude's huge. That dude's huge. I'm surprised David could pick the man's sword up and swing it to cut his head off with it. Now don't get me wrong. I know the Bible talks about David being also a warrior. He he fought off a lion. He fought off bears. He's protected his sheep. He has skills. Folks, I I can't reach as high as old Goliath was. That man was huge. I cannot pick up a sledgehammer and hold it by the end of the handle. And Goliath could, and he wielded it very well. (laughs) That man was huge. And David, unwavering faith, dispelled all trepidation. He was not afraid of what might happen. He knew what had to be done. He went and did it. Our, our lesson today is, is based off Esther chapter 4 and the, the challenge that Mordecai gives to Esther in chapter 4, verse number 8 says, also he gave a writing, he gave, this is Mordecai, gave a copy of the writing and the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them and showed it to Esther. Now I'm not going to go through and tell you how Esther got to where she is. We've already heard that twice this weekend and I hope that you're with me when we say this. He shows it to Esther and he declares it to her and charge her that she should be the one that goes in before the king and makes supplication and uh, and makes the request before for her people. Esther is not very old. It's estimated that she was she was a teenager when she was taken. She was young. She was taken and she's been in the palace for a few years and she replies to Mordecai at this point, Mordecai, how am I supposed to go before the king? He's not asked for me in a month. You know the rule. I know the rule. If I go in there and he doesn't t- hand out his scepter towards me, I will be killed. You know what happened to Vashti. He got annoyed with her for what she did and he offed her. He was done with her. I can hear all of these thoughts racing through her mind. And she says to Mordecai, Mordecai, you've got to understand, she, he's not called for me in a month. And Mordecai says to her, this is for you to do. The Lord's will will be done. Perhaps this is exactly why you're in the position that you are. Esther lived a life of, of, of luxury there. She was well taken care of. She had her own people to serve her. She was, she was very comfortable there. When the king called for her to come and, and uh, to do whatever that they needed to be done, she was willing to do that. Um, she was, she's known for, for her admirable traits there. She says, I'll, I'll do this. But she asked Mordecai, tell the children of Israel, gather all the Jews that are present in Shushan, tell them to fast for me. Don't eat or drink anything for three days. 
And I and my maidens will fast likewise, and I will go unto the king, which is according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. Folks, Esther says, if I perish, I perish. She could have easily said, Mordecai, I, I don't have time for this. I'm, you know, just thank you for all that you've done for me. Uh, I'm good. I've got a great position. I, I'm very happy and pleased where I'm at. But she didn't. She says, yes, I will do this for the saving of my people. I will do this. You do this for me. You pray for me. You fast for me. This is a big deal. Don't take it lightly that Queen Esther says, if I perish, I perish. This is... I am willing to die for this cause. To, to dispel trepidation, fear of what might happen, Esther casts all of that fear away and she says, if I die, then I die. Esther, I, I admire her the most. I, I've, out of all of these examples that we've gone through, as has been said, God's not mentioned in the book of Esther. But these other heroes that we've talked to, They've had some kind of direct communication with God. They've had prophets that directly speak to God. They've had God himself speak to him. Esther did this because it's the right thing to do. Not because God came down and spoke to her. Consider that courage is required all throughout our life. Our fears often come in various sizes and in different intensities. Moral courage requires forethought and conviction. It's against our human nature to stick our necks out out of our comfort zones in order to, to disrupt the status quo. Our principles are challenged when we're faced with trials and dangers. How or well are we training our morals and our courage? I thank you for your kind attention. I made it all the way to the end of the clock, so I'll shut her down. I appreciate you all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brother JP. We do have the uh, Lord's Supper supplies up here in front and in the back, so if you need to grab those for the, uh, the worship hour, uh, we'll be back here in about 10 minutes.